Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. There's Jerry over there. And here we are doing stuff you should know about hoarding. Yeah, Jerry's over there under a stack of pizza boxes and newspapers. Yes, but Jerry proudly displays them to anybody who comes into the office and makes eye contact with her, which makes her a collector of those things. A big difference. Well, yeah, I didn't say she's a hoarder. She's a pizza box collector. I got you. Okay. She likes those greasy after stains. Yeah, supposedly that prevents you from recycling pizza boxes. I think we talked about it in one of our episodes before, but I, th- I think that that's a PSA that bears repeating. Yeah, I I never got a final answer on that, so I throw mine in the recycling anyway. I don't know if that comes up the works or not. Is there a spectrum or anything like that? Or you're like, oh, this one is just so obviously loaded with cheese um, that I, I, I can't possibly recycle this. Well, mine are always loaded because I specifically request that the pizza be delivered face down in the box. Do you? Yeah, it's a little weird, but I like it that way. <laughs> it's, a, it's a way to do it for sure. Upside down pizza. Actually, you know what I should do is just uh, tear the box in, in half and at least recycle the top. That I think you may have just solved the real problem. Yeah. All right. From nice now on. work. I think we do need to do a follow-up recycling episode because I, I would imagine it's probably advanced by leaps and bounds since we last discussed it. Yeah, and here in my area of Atlanta, they quit um, taking glass. Really? Um, a few months ago. Too heavy? Not enough payoff? I think it was just, yeah, and and or word got out that they weren't even recycling it. So um, since then, they have set up places around Atlanta, one specifically at the Edgewood mm-hmm. uh, Target Mm-hmm. Park, you know, there's a bunch of stuff there, but in the Target parking lot, right? They have these huge glass recyclers there, and I, I meet up with the fellow winos about once every two weeks. And nice. We all shamefully toss in, you know, dozens of bottles of empty wine. So much dead yellowtail. Yeah, and we no, I don't drink that stuff. Uh, but we just we it's nice. It's sort of like a uh, a wine uh, meeting. So much dead Paul Masson. <laughs> like a wine clatch. I'm like, oh, what are you throwing away there? How was that? Is that right? Really? Have huh. you gotten any recommendations from those yeah. chance encounters? It's Have literally you? happened where we're, we're, you know, I would meet a fellow wino. We're throwing away tons of bottles. And then we decide to own our shame and be like, hey, this one was pretty good, by the way. And start up a conversation and then I get maced. Yeah. You take, you take the bottle and go, huh, night train. Haven't heard of this one. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll give that a try. And I like the handy grip of the bottle. I never tried night train. Did you have that? Dude, it's it's a nightmare is what it is. Yeah, I would drink the um like you don't even sober up before you get a crushing headache from it. <laughs> right. You, it comes with a headache, that's what it says on the bottle. <laughs> yeah. Um what would I drink? Um Mad Dog. Mhm. Which I like, mean there's a reason they they are sold right next to each other. Yeah, can you even call those wine? No. It's not wine. It's wine like it's uh not even Prudo. It's wine like malt liquor is beer. It's related, mm, but it's drink malt liquor too. It's funny different. the stuff well, you sure. would drink in college. Sure, remember the well, Mickey's Big Mouths? Yeah, and Cold Forty Five came in like gigantic like bottles. That was one of the big attractions of it, you know. Yeah, it was those, those Mickey's. Man, I would th- that was our jam for a little while. I I never got into those. I know what you're talking about. Didn't they have like the um like a question or a trivia thing or something on the underside of it? The bottle, the lid. Oh, I don't know. Well, they were the little green hand grenade bottles, little barrels, and uh, I don't know which came first or after. It was either, I guess they switched to just the regular, like, uh, Coca-Cola style twist-off cap, Uh metal Mm twist-off. And I think they might have, I think they did have something underneath it, actually. There was something under there. Maybe it was like a poker game or a car game. Or you've just won liver disease. (laughs) (laughs) But before that, then, I think they had these... Really unique pull tabs because it was a big fat mouth. Mickey's, that's why they called it that, Mickey's Big Mouth. Uh-huh. Uh, so they had to have a very unique um, bottle cap pull cap that was just sort of interesting. Nice. Back in the day, man. Back in the day when I was, yeah, I'm not going to rap now. And we're now refined with our beverage consumption. Yeah, yeah, we are. 
I only drink Colt 45 out of a chilled <laughs> glass now. I got a nice whiskey bar set up at home that's separate from the regular bar. <laughs> oh, wow. With just like rye and bourbons and scotches and Irish. Mm-hmm. And it's very nice. nice. And that a bunch does of sound uh, nice. little ad- additional. Uh, I've gotten now to where I will put in little drops of uh, little tinctures and shrubs and things. Oh, yeah. Occasionally. Shrubs are great. I made my own once and it it's actually worth the effort. Yeah, my buddy Eddie, you know Eddie, he he makes mm-hmm. his own uh he actually does it in the in the bottle, but he will he'll do like a cherry bourbon or an apple. Oh, like infused bourbon? Yeah. Those shrubs though, man, uh it's actually not very hard and they last forever because what you're doing is basically I don't know if it's fermenting or pickling or something, but you're doing something to the fruit that you're macerating with the sugar and it it just lasts forever and it's just such a nice little tangy pop. It's like kimchi. You got to bury it in your yard for. Kind of. It's close to that, actually. It's not. It's it's like a, a the Yankee version of kimchi, but with fruit, and you put it in your booze. Well, this is all very hoardy like. Well, hold on. Even before we get into hoarding, <laughs> oh. we still have another tangent to go on. Oh, our, our old buds. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's announce it. Okay. So, uh, Carolyn Irvin and Kristen Conger? Seriously? Well, I know it was, it, it was Conger, but she's been, since gotten married and I don't oh. know if she took her husband's last name. <laughs> I thought you couldn't remember. No, of course. Kristen Conger. No, I don't know. Something tells me Conger did not take his last name. Right, right. I could see that. Because then I would no longer be able to call her Kongs, which I know she loved. That's true. And she was probably there at the Social Security Administration thinking, I, I can't do this. What about Chuck? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she thought of that. At any rate, Carolyn and Kristen, the former hosts of um, Stuff Mom Never Told You. Yeah. Which is now hosted by our pals um, Emily and Bridget. That's right. Right. So Kristen and Carolyn went off on their own, and they have now started a new podcast. That's and this right. Is the, this is the grand announcement here on Stuff You Should Know. That's right. It's called Unladylike, and uh, I have I've heard the the trailer, so it sounds great. And anything they're going to do is going to be great. They're just they're pros. They really like. Uh, I know stuff. Mom never told you was started with uh, Molly and mm-hmm. Conger, mm-hmm. but when Caroline came along, it really just found its true voice. No offense, Molly. <laughs> and um, <laughs> she just trashed her home office. <laughs> Uh, it's just a great show, and Unladylike is is going to be awesome, and, a, and a, I believe it's got a, a bit of a different flavor with uh, interviews and stuff like that. But it is definitely going to be dealing with uh, feminism and women's issues, and uh, oh yeah, advocacy. And uh, their their logo is great; it's a big middle finger, uh-huh. which uh, is just so them. Yep. So uh, they have a site up. I think you can get their podcast anywhere you get podcasts. That's kind of how it works. But they have a site uh, as well called unladylike.co super british not dot com dot co okay that's right so best of luck ladies i'm sure it'll be great and uh you are always on our minds and in our hearts how about that (laughs) so (laughs) nice of you good luck carolyn and Kristen. it's gonna be great now can we hoard yes finally at long last (laughs) well let's take a commercial break shall we (laughs) no can you imagine molly would trash her home office again (laughs) so we're talking hoarding today Believe it or not, everybody. Um, and I, I, basically everyone is fairly well aware of hoarding yeah. thanks to a couple of high profile, um, reality TV shows about hoarders and hoarding. Um, and then there have also been appearances of hoarders in literature. So even before it kind of became like part of the cultural awareness, it was also already kind of there like everybody thought you know there's some guy out there who has a house full of something that he picked up on the side of the road and yeah his it's just accumulated and he can barely get around his house like that was there before but thanks to those tv shows which is actually which actually sprung out of the first real research on hoarding as its own disorder um, from the early 1990s by a Smith College psychology professor named David O. Frost and then two of his students, Rachel Gross and Tamara Hartle. Um, those three people together actually formed the basis of our knowledge about hoarding the disorder. They took it out of the cultural reference. They took it out of the realm of Freud and, and they got it ultimately all the way up into the DSM-5 in 2013, which is 
About the best you can hope for is an undergrad psychology student. Yeah, you get your DSM tattoo. Mm hmm. Tattoo? Yep. Uh, and I believe those shows, one was called Hoarders and one was called uh, Jerry's Pizza Box Collection. No, Jerry's a collector. <laughs> well, it was Jerry's Pizza Box Collection, colon, I'm not a hoarder. Right. It was a little, little mouthy, a little wordy. The log line was, if you're looking for a show about a hoarder, keep looking. <laughs> but if you like pizza boxes and We're a lady who doesn't speak. <laughs> eight, seven central. <laughs> It'd be very David Lynchian, just this mute woman walking around. Poking yeah, with pizza a boxes. blackout bar over <laughs> most of her face everywhere she looks. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get it going with a stat here. Uh, back in the day, I was stat man. Remember that? Oh, of course. So I'm going to reprise that role. Okay. Do you have your cape still? Oh, yeah. It's on. See? Oh, yeah, I see. It's velvet. I couldn't see it. You weren't turned the right way? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, it's a thin cape <laughs> for a broad fella. Right. Uh, so estimates, no one really knows because, like you said, it's very recently that it's been recognized as its own disease um, and not a symptom of another thing, even though it is, as we will see later, very much comorbid with other uh, other issues and mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. But uh, despite the fact that we don't know a ton about the stats, there are estimates that say anywhere from 0.4 percent to as many as 5 percent. Of, That's like, high. Is this humans or humans? Americans, humans. Uh, yeah, I think the general population. Okay. Which that would make its prevalence higher than schizophrenia. Oh wow! Yeah, which I actually kind of believe if I stop and think about it. Sure. Well, yeah. the thing is, though, you don't. Uh, this is, and we're going to talk about all this stuff, but it's not often the kind of thing that presents itself out in public because these people are hiding in their houses full of stuff. No, no. And one of the things, one of the early misconceptions about hoarders that we'll see is that it was mostly older people who were hoarding. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, it turns out that they're the ones who get thrust into the limelight because it's a progressive chronic disease. They've been hoarding longer. <laughs> exactly. So by the time the news media becomes aware of this and drags these poor people out into the limelight, um, their their hoard has gotten very big and they have aged. So... That's why we initially thought that just older people were hoarders. It turns out it actually starts far earlier in life, typically. Yeah, like a show about a uh, a twelve year old with one corner of their room <laughs> too messy. Yeah, just it's looking at fun. it like this is going to be huge <laughs> one day. And we're, we're joking Seriously. here, but this is a, a serious mental illness. But we we joke about all kinds of things, so I don't want anyone to get uh, upset about things like that. No, no. If you're new to the podcast, go listen to the Comas episode. <laughs> That'll set things straight. All right. So some of the symptoms of hoarding, um, and we're we're going to get into also in a bit the uh, I guess myths and separating those two is really important because it's very easy for someone to very dismissively say, "Oh, they're a hoarder," because they have a lot of stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. In my family, uh, my in-laws, uh, well, let me let Steve off the hook. Specifically, <laughs> my mother-in-law, uh -huh. my grandmother-in-law, uh, Mary, the eldest general of the Stuff You Should Know Army, mm -hmm. and uh, my uh, aunt, Sue, Sharon, Sue, and Mary, they they have a lot of stuff, and we call it the disease sort of as a joke. Um, but but they do are they not actually – well, they're not hoarders at all, but they got a lot of stuff. They have a hard time throwing away, you know, the stuff that they had that they think someone in the family might want. Mm -hmm. But I think that stuff, that's, that's pretty typical. A lot of people are like that. And a lot of people have a basement room with a lot of junk in it out of, uh, being too busy or lazy or maybe just a bit of the disease where you just like, eh, I can't bear to part with it even though I really should. But that is not hoarding. Well, so my question would be then, have you ever seen them and do you feel like they have the ability to clear out like the attic or donate some of the stuff? Like, yes, do, can't, do they, they have the ability to part with the stuff. There have been pushes at various times, like mm -hmm. when they're moving and stuff like that. Of course, it's a good time to do that. Um, it is always a bit of a painful experience. But I think, like I said, everyone's got a little – not everyone. Some people are so unsentimental 
that they'll just back the dumpster up and just empty their house into it and say, I'll get new junk. Sure. But, it's um, it's a good way to move. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But they, uh, it is a, a little bit of a hard time. And very famously, their, um, uh, Charlie, their, uh, Emily's grandpa who, uh, who left us on our wedding day, um, he famously passed away with like, a, you know, buckets of bent, rusty nails. But mm-hmm. he was not a hoarder. He was legitimately one of those guys who was like, I can straighten these and reuse them one day. And he believed in the value of just not throwing everything away, which is great. So let me ask you this, though. He would he would say kind of with pride, like, look at all these awesome nails that I'm not wasting, you chump. No, not at all. It was just um, – was he ashamed of his bucket of nails? No, he would, he would okay. occasionally get out a nail and straighten it and use it. And it was just, everyone <laughs> in the family knew, like, you know, Charlie, he, he did grow up in the Great Depression. And, and uh-huh. as we will see, that is one of the myths that, oh, all these people just grow up in the Depression, so they value things more. That is not the case. There's no, uh, tie to that. But he is one of those, a gentleman who grew up in the Great Depression, and mm-hmm. and and I love that attitude. We're in such a disposable frame of mind. I think that that these days. The, de- the depression thing has kind of come back for the generation behind us, where they value things a bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good, yeah, you know, because the disposability of products and just everything. Just pulling a dumpster up to your back door and pushing your stuff out as a means of moving. Yeah, or like I'll just eh, that thing didn't work well. I could probably get it repaired, but screw it, I'll get another one. It's only twenty bucks. <laughs> right. Things like that, like I, I, it kind of drives me nuts. So I'm or, or oh wait, my phone has has uh, a new <laughs> version of my phone has just come out. Yeah. So now the company that made my phone is remotely slowing my phone down, so I yeah. have to throw it away and go buy another one. That's definitely part of the problem as well. <laughs> You All know right. what's funny? What? I can totally see uh, Grandpa Charlie saying, everybody gather around, uh-huh. getting a nail out of his rusty nail bucket, straightening it, and just driving it right through the webbing of his hand as a party <laughs> trick. That's what I thought of when, when you said, yeah, yeah, every once in a while he'd get a nail out and straighten it and use it. What? That's he, what I would he think. Was, hey, uh, no, what were the people? He's a pinhead. <laughs> the people that would drive the right nails through their nose. nose. <laughs> yeah. The blockhead, that's what it was. Blockheads. Yeah. Can't believe we did a whole podcast on that. That's that was a good one too. Um all right, so number one on the symptoms though, uh is you literally have an inability to to get rid of things and to stop acquiring things. So you may if you go into a hoarder's home, you may go into their closet and see a rack of clothes with tags on them. Because they're like, oh, I just this is on sale. It's such a good deal. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like I just have to get it, and then it's unworn a decade later. Yeah. So, so the early researchers, David Frost and his two students, um, Tamara Hartle and Rachel Gross, they initially, I think it was specifically Rachel Gross and David Frost. Sorry, but they that first study that they did on hoarders, they assumed that um, it would be all just junk like stuff nobody could possibly want. And they were really surprised when they toured some of the, the their study participants' homes and found, like, stuff still in the package, like clothes, perfectly fine clothes that had never been worn, but piles up to the ceiling that were now had now taken over the kitchen. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the difference between being like, oh, this is actually a pretty good deal. I could use this someday, and hoarding. And another aspect of that too is if you're buying these clothes sure it might be a good bargain but these are women's jeans and you're a man and they are <laughs> the, they're they're like half of your size do people so, do that yeah you know, they'll buy clothes that don't even fit them and are not uh well just I just because you, people can wear what they want so sure sure but i'm saying like don't even fit you right, right. um and they they yeah good point chuck thank you for that but they they basically won't pass up a bargain it's one of the ways that they might acquire something my mom has a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, if you're a man and you dress in women's clothing, that is not a symptom of hoarding. <laughs> no, no, no. And my mom doesn't have that. She has a little bit of the like, oh, it's such a good deal. I feel like mm-hmm. I have to get it. Uh, you mean I went through an open house once and I've never seen more clothing 
owned not just by one person, by several families put together, but it was just one lady's clothes. And like they had built on like an addition to their attic yeah. and their garage top. And it was just filled with clothes, more clothes than anyone could possibly wear. And we noticed that like some of them still had the tags on. We're like, God, this lady has so many clothes. Now looking back after researching this, I'm like, she definitely had a touch of the, the hoarders. D- disorder, I guess. She had a little bit of the hordes. Yeah, it didn't spill out into the rest of her house. So either she, it was just a touch of it, uh, or uh, her family was keeping it in check. Right. But there was definitely you. I you wouldn't believe me if I if I told you how many just sweaters and shirts and dresses <laughs> this lady had. Give me a number. How many sweaters? Sweaters. Yeah. I know you're you, one of your. Superpowers is sweater guesstimating. <laughs> right. Sweaters and jelly beans. I would say, f- just from what we saw, she easily had 200-something sweaters. All right. Easily. And those were just the sweaters, man. Yeah. That's not including, like, tops, blouses, sure. dresses. She had so many clothes. Wow. Yeah. My friend Ryan, I won't say his last name, He, uh, his dad very famously had a, uh, and I don't know, you know what? I asked him last time I saw him, and I can't remember the answer now, but at one point his dad had, uh, like, warehouses with stuff. Because Wow. He's like a, the dream hoarder. Yeah, but I don't know if it was hoarding either because, mm-hmm. as you will see there, as we go on, there are very specific definitions. And just because you want warehouses full of stuff doesn't necessarily mean you're a hoarder, you know? Yeah. What was his stuff? I don't know. Huh. I'll find out. Okay. And follow up. But uh, getting back to the inability to stop acquiring, one of the key points about not getting rid of stuff is they're holding on to things with no value at all. Like right. even sentimental value. Like when you have stacks and stacks of newspapers and magazines for, for decades and decades, those, those don't hold sentimental, about sentimental value, any monetary value, unless you happen to have like the moon landing stuffed in there or something. Mm-hmm. Um you know, it's just, it's like literally it's junk. Right. It can be. It can also be stuff that like is, is actually useful and somebody would want this unopened, yeah. unworn right. dress or something like that. Right. So it can go either way. But the point is, is they can't stop acquiring stuff. They can't help themselves. That's that's part one. Part two, and these things are part and parcel with one another, is they can't bear to give any of it up. Yeah. Like you said, even if it's totally useless, even if it doesn't have any actual real emotional value. But that is a big one that a lot of them point to is like they say, well, no, this means a lot to me. Mm-hmm. Or um, another another explanation or another rationalization among hoarders is that like they're 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 just kind of stockpiling. They might need all these clothes one day. That's they the might, big thing is they might some future need, event that never yeah. happens. Right, exactly. And um, the other one, I think, is that uh, they use it as a reminder. Apparently, there's a um, there's a correlation between faulty recall or um, an inaccurate memory or a lack of trust in one's own memory and hoarding. And so some hoarders will say, well, I, I keep this to remind me that I have to do this in the future or remind me to get in touch with this person. So they imbue importance into all these objects that from the outside are junk and apparently the stuff that they imbue these objects with is is just rationalization it's right. not necessarily really valuable in the way that they they feel like it is to them totally uh another symptom is that in this one I'm kind of curious about we should talk about it is is the stuff is disorganized and very disorganized um however i would think that you could be a hoarder and also be very and maybe be anal retentive and have everything organized but does that immediately disqualify you from what i understand it does huh yeah you can have a lot of stuff and even very odd stuff and if you organize it that's a huge symptom of hoarding that you're not that's a, a box that's not being checked and would probably preclude you from a diagnosis of hoarding because they think that it has to do with your ability in the brain to make decisions. Uh, it's supposedly uh, stems from perfectionism, which we'll talk about. But this this inability to make decisions about, you know, what to keep and what to throw away 
and being so paralyzed by it that you just don't make the decision at all and all this stuff accumulates, that also extends to organizing and sorting. You can't make the decision about what should go where or what goes with what. You just hmm. can't, you can't make decisions when it comes to your material possessions. That's a huge hallmark of and I think a cornerstone of hoarding, the diagnosis. I'm going to take issue with that one officially then on the okay. record. Okay. Like you could have literally have every single symptom and you just might be like, no, all the newspapers go here and mm-hmm. all the stuff goes here and it's literally caving in on me and I can't get rid of any of it and I'm ashamed of it and I have no quality of life, um, but I'm anal retentive. Like – so I'm officially taking issue. No one cares. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you make, you paint a pretty good picture on, uh, in that, in that sense. I think if you, if you have stuff organized, it's probably not having, it's probably not taking over your life. Maybe financially, maybe time wise, but like you could still have people over. Um, your husband or wife isn't leaving you as a result. Your kids aren't ashamed to bring friends to, mm-hmm. over to play. Who knows? But I, I yeah. I don't think – from what I understand, though, as far as the psychological community is concerned, if you can organize, you're probably not a hoarder. I think all those things you just mentioned could still happen if you were organized. Yeah. And this is just my dumb opinion. No, it's, it's possible, though. I might start a show called Chuck's Dumb Opinions. <laughs> That's a good one. Just to follow up each week to this. Yeah. yeah you <laughs> Where I get it all out. Uh-huh. Uh, number three. Did, did you get a load of what Josh said? <laughs> Stupid. Number three is the hoarder feels ashamed. And we talked a little bit about this here and there, but that is definitely one of them. It's not like you walk into a hoarder's house and they're like, have you seen my collection of, uh, dead goldfish? Right. Floating in bowls. Um, although that'd be a weird thing. Although animal hoarding we'll, we'll get to, that's definitely a thing. That's um, like traipsing along the line of performance art. <laughs> right. Uh, but this is the thing is you feel ashamed and that can feed the beast. So you gather all this stuff, you accumulate it, you feel really guilty about it. Mm-hmm. And then one of the things that hoarders do is it makes them feel better to collect this stuff. So then you start hoarding more and they, and the grabster wrote this one, right? Mm-hmm. So the grabster said it's, you know, it's really not unlike an alcoholic. You drink, you get ashamed, you feel those feelings of shame. And so you drink to sort of feel better or forget. Right. So loop. like alcohol is to an alcoholic or um, like somebody who eats for comfort. These these people acquire stuff for comfort or to, like their material possessions are like food to somebody who eats um, as comfort. Right. Yeah. And but they do feel ashamed of the whole thing. Like that's a huge thing. And that's also like I was saying, what differentiates them from collectors. You know, if you have a collection of some really weird stuff, if you, you know, want to show it off to people and you really value it, you you're a collector. If you are ashamed of your collection, your hoard um, and you don't want people to see it, and you know that it's weird, but you just can't do anything about it, that's a symptom of hoarding. That's one of the reasons also why it makes it such a uh, terrible mental disorder, because the the people who are hoarders, they're not they're not like off their rocker or something like that. They're not mentally impaired. They're not like out of touch with reality. They they are they have enough perspective to feel shame about the state that their life is in because of these material possessions that they can't get rid of and can't stop accumulating. And they can't do anything about it. And that's what makes it just such a, a, a sad disorder. They're aware of this yeah. and, and feel shame as a result. Yeah, they're incapable of change. Well, I think that I don't know if incapable is the right word, but with the right help, they're capable. But I think on their own, they're generally incapable. Yes. Well, that's what I mean. I'm not saying you seek treatment and you still can't stop. Although that happens, too. Yeah. Uh, And then finally, another symptom is that you are um, it is really impacting your life. So um, you may have rooms in your house that you can't even use anymore. Like I can't take a bath because that's where I keep the packing peanuts or I can't use a stove because – it has seven microwaves that I bought that are still in boxes stacked on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you will, a lot of times they will, like like a snowplow, just dig a path through their home just so they can get around where they can get around. 
Yeah, apparently among hoarders or among psychologists who study hoarding, it's called they call them goat paths. Yeah. Yep. And they can be dangerous too. Hoarders have been known to have died sure. from their the walking along their goat paths and the stuff on either side just coming down on top of them and pinning them and suffocating them. Yeah. And this and this is the point too where you talked about where uh, they impacting your life, they don't get out much maybe because they don't want to leave their stuff because they're afraid a family member mm-hmm. might come over and, and take things. They are holed up. They don't have anyone over uh, because of the shame. Mm-hmm. So it's just um, they are they're literally trapped by their things. Yeah, figuratively and and literally. And they they also um, they, their houses will also very frequently be in disrepair, not just from the the collections of stuff taking over rooms and just totally changing their meaning. But also, like, uh, if you have a hot water heater and it breaks, you're not going to let some repairman come over. You don't know him. Yeah. You don't, he might touch your stuff. He might take something. Or you feel so much shame that you just won't even invite a stranger to come in and, and, and fix your hot water heater. So they'll just live without hot water forever. Um, they may so also, sad. it's, it's super sad, man. It, we're like, because of documentary television, because of reality television, I think hoarders have kind of gotten a reputation as people are like, go oh, look at those freaks, you know? Yeah. Um, but if you really start to dig into it, and I'm sure some of these shows do this from time to time too, it is a, an extremely sad condition. It just makes you want to help them yeah. when you come across them, you know? And then one other thing is they're also very frequently in debt. Say, Ed, gives the example of um, if their kitchen is just totally covered in stuff and they can't get to the oven any longer, they have to order takeout, which is right. much more expensive than grocery shopping. So their finances are very likely impacted by the their hoarding behavior. Yeah. Good point. Should we take a break? Yeah. All right, let's do it. And we'll come back and talk about some of the myths right after this. So we talked about some of the truths um, and some of the myths are as follows. And you mentioned, um, well, you mentioned the first one, that it affects only older people. Mm -hmm. Um, Another one is that hoarders are are lazy, and that is just not true. Um, They, In fact, they may be very busy in there with – while they may not be organizing – they may be moving things around and obsessing about it and uh, – or, you know, they also might be on the recliner just hoping they don't get caved in on. But the st- point is stuff isn't there because they're lazy. It's a mental illness. Right. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, another uh, another early idea about hoarders is that the reason they hoard is because they had some experience previously in their lives where they came face-to-face with deprivation or scarcity yeah like and so great now depression. yeah the great depression or their dad lost his job when they were a kid and like their family really went through a hard time so now as a as a um in response to that experience they're just trying to get their hands on everything they can and they don't want to throw anything away apparently that is absolutely not the case that that the um science doesn't bear that out at all. And then it, they do think that they are connected to some sort of difficult event previous in life, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with deprivation um, at any point. Like they, they, may, they may have been wealthy. I read a, a Nautilus, I think, a Nautilus article on hoarding, and they profiled this guy who was quite well off, and he hoarded. Um, and I don't think he had ever gone through any financial hardship, and that's apparently par for the course. Well, one of the things that it says one of the traumas could be excessive discipline, which I thought was interesting because Freud, mm-hmm. and I know we said it's been mentioned, it's not a new thing. Like it's been in everything from Dante's Inferno to Silas Marner in 1861, mm-hmm. uh, and Freud talked about it uh, in his day. 
But here's the thing is everyone says Freud was way off. Mm-hmm. Um, but he thought it could be as a result of overly harsh toilet training, which I thought was interesting. Mm-hmm. Because while that is not true, if it came from excessive discipline and you were excessively disciplined while toilet training, you know, maybe he wasn't that far off. Yeah, you're right. He probably wasn't. Like I said before, the guy was one of the history's great thinkers. It's just you shouldn't use the phrase anal character when you're describing what the problem was with hoarding. Which he did. He did. Yeah. But, yeah, you make a really good point, actually, that he – he, maybe he wasn't that far off. But it, it, if it is discipline, overly harsh discipline in, in adolescence, I think that's a big one. Um, I think the loss of a significant other, of a close family member, um, some sort of loss of um, love is a, it can trigger a hoarding behavior in some people or, or has been known to bring – bring the disorder on as well. I can see that. Like, I lost that thing, but I can keep all this. Right. Like, that I can control. Right, and that also would explain why they tend to imbue emotional attachment into their possessions. You know, like, these things are, these things equal love to me, and now I can hang on to them, and they're never going to leave me. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's a very sad disorder. Uh, Another myth is that it's a symptom of uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, Mm -hmm. for many, many, many years. We're just now starting to understand more about it. Uh, But for many years, they thought it was either just straight up was OCD or was just an offshoot of it. Um, But like you said, uh, with the DSM, it is its own distinct disease. But it can be comorbid with OCD and other things like anxiety. So it's... um, I see why people get that confused. Yeah. You know, the, some study took away the criteria for, um, took away the, the hoarding criteria from OCD, right? So it just gave these people a, a checklist to determine whether they had OCD or not, but took hoarding out of the equation. And hoarders tended to, to not qualify for OCD. Only like 16% of them do or something like that. Huh. So it's connected in some cases, but definitely not in all cases. And it's certainly not just an offshoot of OCD itself, like you were saying. Right. Uh, and then finally, and of course, because this is a, uh, a disease and, um, it, just cause you finally get a family member in there against all odds to clean everything out of there, that mm. does not cure you of anything. No, I saw that it just is. First of all, what a horrible experience that would be for the poor hoarder. Oh, yeah. The county comes in or some family members come in with some tough love and just clear all your stuff out. Yeah. So that's number one. But number two, apparently, they say, okay, well, I've got a lot of space to fill now. I better get to work. I'm sure. Like, that's the result of it. Supposedly, so it's a chronic disease, chronic condition, and supposedly recurrence of this is 100%. In all cases, without treatment. Yeah, the Grabster emailed this uh, woman named Lisa Hale, co- um, sorry, founding director of the Kansas City Center for Anxiety Treatment uh, and also uh, adjunct associate professor mm-hmm. at University of Missouri, Kansas City. Okay. So, fighting hayseeds. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Haystacks. I Not like hayseeds. hayseeds. I think hayseed. Isn't that a derogatory name for like a Kansan? Uh, it depends on whether they own it or not, you know? Okay. Um, I'm sure we'll hear. But, uh, she, yeah, she, she said that it, it approaches 100%. Like, that is, that is 100% straight up proof that, that cleaning things out. And while the family member, well, a county just has their directive, but while a family member might think, oh, I've helped them, um, you, you really haven't if that was your solve. No, you you probably the other part of it too is if you come in there all tough love and you need to get your act together and you're just being lazy. What's wrong with you? And clean their stuff out for them. First of all, that's basically abuse, and I don't even know if you need to qualify with basically. I think that's abuse of a a, a mentally ill person. But secondly, um, all you're doing is driving that behavior. That, that's a very stressful event, and the 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 um. The way they deal with stress is through hoarding behavior. So all it's going to do is just turn the notch up on the hoarding that they're doing anyway. And you can probably say goodbye to ever seeing them again after that, too. Yeah. 
man, what a terrible situation. Uh, apparently, we'll talk about you know treatment in a minute, but one of the key factors in treatment is that the family and friends and loved ones of the person who's hoarding and now undergoing treatment, they have to go through therapy themselves because it's, uh, I'm sure, quite easy to look at this with disgust, horror, um, anger. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, I know that that's a natural reaction, yeah. but you ha- you can't follow through on that. You have to approach it from a place of understanding or else all you're going to do is trigger the hoarding behavior even further. Yeah, for sure. If you go in there guns blazing with your broom and your, and your dumpster, uh, you just, yeah, it's just going to get worse. You would just crumble that person. So, um, what causes this is really interesting because, um, we don't know for sure. And there are, they have been everything from, um, lesions on the brain in certain studies, uh, that they found, um, could account for it to, uh, chromosomal defects to possibly genetics. Um, because they found that it's uh, other illnesses, or, or at least that behavior is part of other illnesses that are definitely genetic, and hoarders are more likely to have other family members who are also hoarders. Yeah, like 85% of hoarders surveyed say that they have a family member who's a hoarder, which is way more than the general population. Yeah, so we have no idea what the really underlying cause is, but we do know uh, it's what's called, and this is what... Um, what Hale said, who uh, Ed interviewed, is that it is a neuropsychiatric condition, and it is it's all about, like you were talking about earlier, these processing challenges, um, not mm-hmm. being able to process visually, organizationally, emotionally, and your brain connections aren't aren't working right. Yeah, I remember hearing years ago, like that they they would stick these these poor people into the wonder machine and talk to them about getting rid of their possessions, mm-hmm. saying, like, I want you to imagine, you know, this room and think about all of your newspapers. Now, which newspaper do you want to get rid of? And these people would experience basically physical pain, huge spikes in their levels of stress just thinking about this. But when you said the same thing about somebody else's stuff, they had no reaction whatsoever. It's strictly their stuff and their attachment to it. And another study by uh, David Frost showed that when you give somebody who is a hoarder something um, and say, this is yours now, I think he gave out keychains, their attachment to it was immediate. It was like right right when they knew that they owned the thing and it was theirs, they were now as attached to it as if they'd had it for 50 years. Yeah, It was as important to them. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the brain, and it does have to do with attachment, decision-making, finding um, f- comfort and de-escalation of stress through these material possessions as well. Um, but they just don't quite know what did it. Was it a bad experience as a kid? Uh, are, are you born with a chemical imbalance that doesn't begin to show its symptoms until adolescence? It's just too new. Like, it only became its own thing in the DSM-5, which came out in 2013. Yeah. But it is in the DSM now, which means that insurance companies will pay for treatment for it, which means that a lot more people are going to be studying it than they ever were before. Man, I can't imagine anything more torturous than uh, being strapped in an MRI machine, which is already stressful and Mm -hmm. confining, and then having to quiz people on anxiety-inducing mental illness. Right. Like, you know, we're getting rid of this thing now. And I'm sure they're they're just like want to like bust out of that thing, you know. I'm sure, yeah. I just like yeah. it's like torture. Yeah. Just like, and it's valuable research. So, hats off to the people that do that, and and the people that uh, like the people that administer it, and the people that are brave enough to go in there and and seek that treatment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hats off to them for sure. Man. Literal hats off because you can't wear a hat in an MRI machine. <laughs> no. Take it off. You can you can only wear a mesh helmet. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, there was one other kind of general explanation or hypothesis that explains hoarding um, floating around, and that is that we all have this innate evolutionary instinct. This is to, great to gather stuff. Yeah, right? I really like this. Like it's just it's just what well, it's part of our mammalian heritage, and in uh, they think that in people who hoard, this instinct has basically gone haywire. Yeah. 
like some synapse connected with another synapse that weren't supposed to be connected. Now, all of a sudden, this thing that's a natural thing where, you know, you go to the grocery store, you buy some stuff, you, you keep it in your refrigerator for a week, turns into you can't get enough Sunday circulars to possibly stave off these feelings of anxiety. Yeah, Ed's uh, cool little uh, story reference was uh, like an animal saving food for the winter. Do they work extra long to prepare for a possibly long winter but stay out there and are, are more, more vulnerable to getting eaten by the cheetah uh, while they're collecting stuff? Or do they say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get in the cave. I've got enough stuff. Um, eventually, there will be that long winter and those animals will die out. So – you know, over the course of time, the the long winter evolutionary trait will be the one that's passed on. Yeah, it's really there, interesting. The guy whose paper he based that on, you should see this paper, man. It's got like sigma everywhere, and he's talking about squirrels gathering nuts. But there's all these really complex math and statistical formula that he's got on on his paper. But the the overall gist of it is pretty fascinating, and it proves, or it definitely lends credence to the idea that it is a naturally selected evolutionary trait to gather a lot of stuff. Most of us, though, have this cutoff point where we know, I don't need anything more than this, or anything more than this is irrational. Yeah. And people who hoard definitely don't have that cutoff point. Yeah, we have a room in our house that is full of stuff, and it's uh, not hoarding. It's We don't have a place for this stuff. <laughs> Right. We live in a you know a eighty something year old craftsman, mm -hmm. and the, the you know those houses just don't have the closet space and the storage space. Yeah, we don't have a garage. We do have an attic that has uh, some stuff, and in theory, we could probably move all of this stuff up there. But most of this stuff we kind of need access to more often. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not hoarding, but it's it's just like uh, our house is small. And you we could go, you know, the other route and be go a little more minimalist for sure and get rid of this stuff. Trust me. Sure. But um But if you don't want to, you don't want to. Well yeah, but I mean it's um it's a problem when we have uh, a guest spend the night, which is not often. Because <laughs> that's our quote guest room, unquote. I gotcha. <laughs> you know. Well, I was gonna say you guys need to get to the container store. No, a lot of the stuff's in containers. Oh. <laughs> well you need a container for your containers. <laughs> Uh, and what we do, it's funny, when we do have the occasional guests, they are invariably a very, very close friend or family member, and so they understand, and we we clear the goat path. That's very nice. To the bed. <laughs> very nice. They're like, just dive over onto the bed, and then when you uh, when you wake up and you want to get up, just call us, and we'll lower the crane harness. That's right. But we we are adding, not adding on to our house, but we're, we're finishing the basement. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that will be the solve. Nice. Because we're going to have uh, some lots more good storage down there. There you go. Uh, bing, bang, boom. Problem exactly. solved. Except we're having to do house construction, which is the worst. Right. <laughs> For your stuff. Um, all right. Should we take one more break? Yeah. All right. Let's do that, and we'll come back and talk just briefly about the uh, very famous Collier Brothers and then hit on animal hoarding, which could be the saddest of all hoarding. Mm -hmm. would be remiss if we didn't mention the Langley, uh, Homer and Langley Collier. Uh, we, You said you want to do a full show on them. Yes. So this will be the second time we've covered them. When did we talk about them before? Bizarre Ways to Die. Oh, wow. Which is literally a uh, nine-year-old episode. Yeah, that is old. So I, I would say we could probably still get away with a full episode because – if you listen to the one in April 2009 mm -hmm. and the segment on the Call Your Brothers within that 25-minute episode, right. then uh, you you would probably appreciate a more fleshed-out version. I would love it. But the, just the, the broad strokes of it are that 
Homer Collier um, went blind older in life or uh, later in life, and his brother Langley took care of him. Well, Langley was uh, a hoarder and accumulated more and more stuff, and eventually uh, Langley died. He was crushed by his stuff, and Homer, who was 100% dependent on Langley, um, starved to death in their brownstone, and they were found Ta-da! separately, uh, weeks apart. This is in Harlem, New York City, and uh, if you just look up pictures of this, uh, and the the crews and the removing of things. It's really something else. And mm-hmm. um, there's actually a little park there named the Collier Brothers Park. Yeah. That in early 2000s, uh, they, there was a push to get that changed because they were like, we should not uh, name a park after these guys. <laughs> right, yeah. uh, but as far as I can tell, it's still named that. Uh, it tried to, I don't think that went anywhere. Huh. But that, yeah, let's we, definitely do a, uh, and in fact, I think it was called Collier Syndrome for a while too, huh? Yeah, for a while. I mean, they were pretty famous because all the New York papers got in there and, like, printed all sorts of pictures. And they, they had, a, like, just a fascinating story. All right. Now, we might as well finish on the saddest of notes, which is animal hoarding. And um, we're not talking about, well, it could be Crazy Cat Lady, but not necessarily. I think she's a archetype of animal hoarders. Right. So in this case, we are talking about, and I know you've seen stories probably on the news here and there. Um, these are people that, that hoard animals to the extent where it's just like the other stuff. It is, uh, their house is often filled with feces and smells of ammonia, full of maybe fleas and ticks, can't have people over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, it, and it's one of the saddest because it's, these people can't bear, they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah, by saving right. these animals, but they're not because these animals, almost one hundred percent of the time, are very much suffering. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like hoarding, but you know your your newspapers and plastic grocery bags don't suffer with animal hoarding. The hoarder suffers and the animals suffer as well because no matter how great the intentions of the animal hoarder are, and apparently that is the one of the the bases of. Uh, animal hoarding is that they really do have the best of intentions. They feel like they're rescuing the animals that no oh, yeah. one else wants. They're animal lovers. They're taking them into their home. Yeah, they're they're feeding them. They're caring for them. The problem is, is they can't stop acquiring them. So it reaches a point where the animals they they can't possibly. There's not enough hours in the day to properly care for mm-hmm. all the animals. And even if you had help, and you um. You had the money to buy uh, food and and um, veterinary care for all these animals. There's still a huge factor in that these animals are living very close together mm-hmm. in ways that they should not be. That's not natural for them, so they're stressed out all the time. Yeah, and uh, another one of the, the hallmarks could be, not always, but a lot of times these are people that are um, left alone in life, either from being widowed or divorced or just their their family has gone or they just may have a trouble interacting with people. And these animals uh, in this article you sent, they call it a conflict free relationship and they surround themselves with this thing because it's it's filling them with something that they can't get oftentimes out of humans. Right. Which is unconditional love. Yep. The problem is, is so again. Sad. Uh, it is very sad because there's that extra component, the extra very important component of suffering animals. But and when people hear about this stuff, you just immediately like, like kind of hiss at the people who who do this when you hear about it on the news and don't yeah. really know what's going on. But again, when you dive into the psychology behind it, it's extraordinarily sad because these people have the best intentions for these animals, and even while they're caring for these animals they they are they're suffering as well through this indecision like do is do i love this dog or or is this one my favorite or should i adopt it out and they just can't decide so they just avoid the decision and just acquire more and more animals again to the detriment of all the animals involved yeah and uh, just like with regular hoarding um removing these animals because by the time you see it on the news it's probably because um the, the county is in there and animal control mm-hmm. is in there and you see them, these sad, sad stories where they're literally taking out these like dogs clearly suffering from malnutrition or cats yeah. or whatever. And um, 
that does not solve the problem. You know, they have to seek therapy. And just like with, with object hoarding, um, if you're a family member, confronting them, being angry, even though this one is probably even tougher to not be angry if you're an animal lover. Right, yeah. You need to just keep that in check and try and be compassionate and help them so you can help the animals as well. Right. So there are some stats on this animal thing. Where, where did you get this? Where was this from? This is a good article. Oh, man, I wish you hadn't asked. I'll tell you by the time you're done with the stats. All right. Um, I'll just tick through a couple of these. Uh, every year, 3,500 hoarders, animal hoarders, come to the attention of the authorities. Uh, 250,000 animals affected each year. Uh, this one is really sad. 80% of animal hoarders have diseased, dying, or dead animals on the premises at the time. Um, it can be comorbid up to four, uh, actually is about 40% of the time. Um, object hoarders are also hoarding animals. Um, and like I was talking about being, being lonely or widowed, uh, perhaps or divorced, uh, 70% of animal hoarders, um, who the authorities know about, mm-hmm. uh, are females, or single, widowed, or divorce. So the thing is, is that's skewed uh, differently for some reason. Apparently, if you just go out and sample the community, hoarding is pretty much evenly divided among men and women. I'm not sure why we typically think of them as women, but uh, apparently... For animals or in general? In general. Oh, uh, well, this is animal specifically, so... Oh, okay. I got you, I got you. There may be some sort of uh, uh, deeper compassion from women. I don't know. Who knows? But the, I don't want to uh, to undermine the efforts of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. <laughs> of course. Whose site this came from. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, those great stats. Good website. Yeah. So let's talk real quick about treatment of all kinds of hoarding. Um, that's a big one is the, the family intervention and loving support is a huge part of it. Because hoarders apparently don't initiate treatment themselves, even though they know that they're suffering typically. Um, but apparently talk therapy is proving to be the best treatment for hoarding. And that's where, uh, say, a cognitive behavioral therapist talks you through your own beliefs about things. Like, well, you know, what will happen exactly if you have to give away your your plastic grocery bags and that you they make you say it out loud and when you say it out loud maybe there's a little part of your brain that's like wait a minute that does sound a little kooky and maybe they say well really what you just said even if that did happen even if that negative outcome did happen is that really as as bad as it sounds in reality and they just kind of talk you through your beliefs while at the same time basically dragging them out into the open so that they're not just in your head anymore, they're out there and you kind of have to evaluate them in a different way, speaking with the, uh, this trained professional. Yeah, and I would imagine they, uh, it, it's probably a go slow thing, like mm-hmm. maybe next week you bring in something that you care about and we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of it together. Um, I doubt if it's like they have some talk therapy and then they just go through and clear the house out. It's probably a very gradual thing to heal someone of this. Yeah, but I think it is gradual, like you said, and again, family has to support it because, you know, they may give the person, they say, like, your therapist knows exactly how you feel every Thursday at 2 o'clock, you know? I mean, you're there for an hour, Um, probably more than that if you are a diagnosed hoarder uh, and you're undergoing treatment, but the point is is it's not an inpatient treatment. You go back home afterward, and they give you homework and if you're a chronic hoarder, you're probably not going to do the homework. So you need to have family saying, well, didn't Dr. So-and-so say you needed to, to start to clear this room out this week? And just, just kind of be there and know what's going on and support the treatment as well and not just leave them to their own devices. Yeah, and the hoarders that have no family and support system, those are the ones that are just uh, so tragic because they're the least likely to get help and seek help mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, potentially – die a very kind of sad, lonely life surrounded by their stuff. Yeah, I think those are the ones that are the ones you see on the news, the ones that don't have family and friends anymore. Yeah. So I guess the upshot of all this, Chuck, is that if you know a hoarder, um, maybe go be nice to them and see if you can help them out because they are most likely suffering. Compassion. Yeah, there you go. Uh, if you want to know more about hoarding, you can type that word in the search bar. Bring up this excellent article by Ed Grabinowski on HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said that, it's time for listener mail. Uh, short and sweet is what I'm going to call this because 
cracks me up occasionally when someone is just cracked up by some dumb thing we said. Okay. <laughs> I know this one. Uh, hey, guys, you made my day once again. I spend December listening to Christmas music. Me too, by the way. Oh, man, I was done in week one. Yeah, I can I can muscle through generally for the most part. Not 100%, because eventually Emily can go 100%. It wasn't the Christmas spirit, just Christmas music this year. I was like, ugh, I can't take this at all. Yeah, yeah. Eventually I have to say, all right, um, we need to like turn on Radiohead or something. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I go to, because she'll go, she can always listen to Radiohead. Yeah, she's like, I love Radiohead's <laughs> Christmas album. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? <laughs> um <laughs> now I'm just hearing various versions of that in my head. Uh, <laughs> very nice. Um, so I spend December listening to Christmas music, so I got behind on my podcast. I'm currently listening in reverse to December. Uh, I was just driving to work listening to Cake, and I almost had to pull over because I was laughing so hard at the conversation about oven doors. Uh, <laughs> Josh, or I'm sorry, Chuck, do you have a window in your oven door? Josh, of course. What am I, a communist? Uh, in between... <laughs> That and Chuck baking in his dishwasher. Uh, you two made this a perfect day. Uh, gotta say, I cannot wait to see you next week again in Portland. Uh, my Stuff You Should Know bingo board is ready. Mm-hmm. Travel safe. And that is Jen Hunt. Jen, by the time this comes out, we will have just been in Portland. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe we have even met you. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed the show. Hope everybody in Portland enjoyed the show. And as a follow-up, I don't know if I officially said... Oh, I'm glad you're saying this. I think I posted on Facebook, but I definitely do not have an oven uh, window. No, Chuck is officially a communist. He has an (laughs) oven without a window, and I've never seen anything like it before. It's like a tank. It's great. Yeah, it's a good-looking oven. I don't want to see that junk cooking. Uh, Okay. Well, if you want to get in touch with us to let us know how we cracked you up, we love hearing about that. You can tweet to us. I'm at Josh Um Clark and at SYSK Podcast. I also have a website called areyouseriousclark.com. Uh, you can hang out with Chuck on facebook.com slash Charles W. Chuck Bryant or at slash stuff you should know. You can send us an email to stuff podcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com.